And now, ladies and gentlemen, here to begin our program, please give a warm welcome to the president of the American Society of Criminology, Mr. Jim Lynch. Thank you. I, I want to welcome you all to the awards ceremony, which everybody's pretty familiar with. Um, I think before we start, I want a, a, a few ground rules, just two. Uh, one ground rule is that when you, your name is called, you come up and you come up those stairs and come this way. It increases the probability of you getting your award. And not, <laughs> I should also tell you that uh, I'm, I'm not a sort of inauspicious history with the award ceremony. I think it was in 1994 or thereabouts. Uh, Al Bloomstein was president, and I was chair of the Gene Cart competition, where you have actual checks in your hot little hands. And, and um, uh, Al kept calling my name and calling my name. And I was, I was up in my room with Dick Bennett having a beer, actually. <laughs> and, and I entirely missed the Gene Cart part. So. I'll try and do better this time. So um, I think what we'd like to do is start with uh, the Ruth D. Peterson Fellowship for Racial and Ethnic, Ethnic Diversity. Um, there are three winners uh, this year, and uh, two of whom are here. Um, and so I, let me start by uh, asking uh, Matthew Clare to, to come to the podium. Is Matthew here? There he is. Okay. So Matthew is a PhD candidate in the Harvard Department of Sociology. He's broadly interested in the law, criminal justice, culture, race and ethnicity, and social theory. His research has been published in Criminology, Law and Social Inquiry, Social Science and Medicine, and Socioeconomic Review, uh, and has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Center for American Policies, and the Program in, in Criminal Justice Policy and Management. Uh, Matt has received awards from the Law and Society Association and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. His current research interests center on the causes and consequences of racial socioeconomic disparities in the criminal justice system. Matt's dissertation project, which draws on an in-depth interviews with criminal defendants and eth ethnographic observations collected in the Boston area courthouses from 2015 to 2017, complements his prior research project by considering the means defendants attached to criminal justice processing. Matt, uh, we hope this fellowship helps you finish your dissertation and continue your, uh, your productive way. Thank you. Um, our, our second winner is uh, Aaron Infante from Arizona State University. Aaron, could you come up? Uh, Aaron is a doctoral student in the so School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Her research interests include quantitative methods and applications to the test of extended theories of intergroup relations and conflicts. She is also interested in matters of race and ethnicity and crime and justice. She spent the last past year designing and administering surveys to two independent samples to develop and validate new multidimensional scale of perceived Latino threat. Currently, she is working on her third round of data collections to validate this scale in a more general sample. The research efforts will set the stage for a dissertation which seeks to test the intervening mechanisms of perceived Latino threat and the relationship between minority population size and punishment. Aaron, we hope that this funding will help you finish your dissertation more quickly. God knows we need more light shed on the interplay between ethnicity, crime, and the criminal justice system. I'd like to move on to the Gene Card Student Paper Award. Of, uh, I think that uh, I already confessed the, the, the mistakes of the past, so I won't go into them again. I think, uh, but it is sort of interesting that we have two reps from Wiley here to make sure I do it right this time. So Eric and Jennifer, could you please come up? I think um, our first place winner is Wade C. Jacobson, of Penn State University and more recently of the University of Maryland. Thought I'd get that in. It, 
It's my honor to present uh, the first place award in the Gene Cart competition to Wade C. Jacobson. I am happy to say that he is now uh, at the University of Maryland. Wade, was, uh, this award is granted in recognition of your outstanding paper on suspended networks, school punishment, and the mechanisms of interpersonal exclusion. Congratulations. The second place award goes to Paul L. Taylor, the University at Albany. Uh, it's my honor to present the second place award in the Gene Card Competition to Paul Taylor from the University of Albany. Paul, you're receiving this award in recognition of your outstanding paper, Dispatch Priming and the Police Decision to Use Deadly Force. The third place award is given to Rachel Ellis, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Rachel, you are receiving this award for your exceptional paper, You Are Not Serving Time, You Are Serving Christ, Neoliberal Religious Culture and Service of Mass Incarceration. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, the next award is the Teaching Award. Um, and this year, the recipient is Michelle Interbitzen uh, from Oregon State University. <laughs> the Teaching Award is a lifelong achievement award designed to recognize excellence in undergraduate and or graduate teaching over the span of an academic career. Uh, Michelle, I'm, uh, I'm honored uh, to be able to give you this award this year. You've been uh, teaching in sociology, criminology, and criminal justice courses at the college level since 1992, and you have an extensive record of teaching at many in different institutions and many different student populations, including in incarcerated students, first-year students, and athletes. It's an interesting combination, that. So, uh, Dr. Interbitson was also worked to help students learn from other students during the inside-out mentoring based classes. She has developed curricula across a variety of setting, settings, prisons, juvenile facilities, universities, community colleges, honored colleges, and study abroad. So, Michelle, congratulations. Um, I think the next award is the Ruth Sloan Cavan Young Scholar Award. Uh, this year, this award goes to Kermit Ryder, University of California, Irvine. In selecting you for this award, the selection committee noted that in this short time, you have written three outstanding books and 12 articles. In this body of work, you have boldly carved out a new territory and taking academic risks to advance theory, policy, and knowledge in the areas of solitary confinement and extreme punishment. Uh, the next award is the Outstanding Article Award. Uh, we have three recipients who uh, collaborated on, on the winning piece. Um, Michael Campbell, Matt Vogel, and Joshua Williams, all from UMSL. This award is given for your outstanding article, Historical Contingencies and the Evolving Importance of Race, Violent Crime, and Region in Explaining Mass Incarceration in the United States. In recommending your article, the committee found your article to be a well-written manuscript on timely and critical topic, as well as having an innovative emphasis on historical contingency and understanding recent trends in incarceration with implications for other criminal justice topics beyond imprisonment. Overall, the committee felt that the article offers a significant advance to the now extensive literature on imprisonment in the United States. Congratulations. Um, 
this is uh, the next. The next award is the Michael J. Hindelang Book Award. Um, uh, I want to say one thing about the committee. Uh, this is the hardest working committee in the business. I think they review more books, and Simon Singer did an outstanding job organizing that committee and, and leading them through their work. So I want to say thanks to Simon and to all the other people on the committee. The Michael J. Hindelang Award, established in 1992, is given annually for a book published within three calendar years preceding the year in which the award is made. That makes most outstanding contributions to research in criminology. Um, this year, it is my honor to present this award to my cousin, Mona Lynch. At the <laughs> from the University of California at Irvine. Mona's not really my cousin, so. Uh, the, Mona's receiving this award for, uh, for her book, Hard Bargains, The Coercive Power of Drug Laws in Federal Courts. In nominating Mona's book, the Hindelang Committee noted that Hard Bargains is an impressive addition to a rich tradition of court organizational research and criminology by focusing on prosecutorial and adjudication practices generating federally sentenced drug defendants, the book reveals this destructive power, this destructive federal legal power in action and makes a compelling argument that containing and redirecting these punitive forces will require more than just formal policy change or change to the law on the books. Congratulations. Thanks, <laughs> Uh, you know I couldn't resist it. Um, the next set of awards uh, is the a ASC Fellows. Uh, the title of fellow is given to those members of the society in good standing, I guess that means you paid your dues, I think, the, who have achieved distinction in criminology. The honorary title fellow recognizes persons who have made a scholarly contribution to the intellectual life of the discipline, whether in the form of a single major piece of scholarship or cumulative scholarly contribution. Longevity, longevity alone is not sufficient, which sort of rules me out on that one. In addition, a fellow must have made a significant contribution to the field through the career development of other criminologists and or through organizational activities within the ASC. Uh, the first recipient of this uh, honor is Sean Bushway from the University of uh, SUNY Albany. I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Sean as an ASC fellow. He is in the Public Administration School at SUNY Albany. Although relatively young, I use that guardedly, Sean, the, uh, he has amassed a body of innovative work on the interrelationship between the criminal justice system and the labor force. He has focused principally on imprisonment, but he has also done some creative work on prosecution and the impact of criminal history records on employment. Uh, in the process, Sean has generated a good deal of knowledge about the quality of criminal history data. Uh, his expert testimony on, the, was it Lyft or Uber? Uber? Uber. So you have free Uber rides for your rest of your natural life, I think. It's a, Unfortunately, no. Oh, well, <laughs> so um, Sean, for all this work and for all that is yet to come, uh, the American Society of Criminology names you an ASC fellow. Thanks. I think our second recipient is Candace Crutchnut from the University of Toronto. So. I'm, I'm equally pleased to welcome Candace Crutchnut as an ASC fellow. Candace is currently a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. Her research is extensive and has focused on women offenders, the victimization of women, and women in the criminal justice system. She is the author and editor of many books and government reports, as well as innumerable articles on these topics. Her most recent book with Katrin Bruldefeld, my apologies, Katrin, for that, uh, that um, Lives of Incarcerated Women was published in 2016, and she co-authored an impressive report from the National Academy of Science on estimating the incidence of rape and sexual assault. Candace, for this great body of work on women, crime, and the criminal justice system, the American Society of Criminology names you as fellow. The next recipient is Lorraine Maserol from the University of Queensland. Lorraine is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow 
a professor of the School of Social, Social Science at the University of Queensland, and chief investigator with the ARC Center of Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course. Throughout her career, Lorraine has done research on a variety of topics centering on law enforcement, including experimentation, policing, drug law enforcement, regulatory crime uh, control, and crime prevention. She has published numerous books and articles on these topics. Her skills have been recognized by a number of editorships, awards, and competitive research grants. Lorraine, to all of these achievements, we add one more, Fellow of the American Society of Criminology. And the fourth recipient uh, is Eric Stewart from Florida State University. <laughs> Eric Stewart is the Ronald L. Simmons Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Florida State University. Over a not so very long career, Eric has conducted a very large no a body of work with interrelated, uh, that inter interrelates crime, community, and race in a complicated and nuanced way. He has taken the multi-layered approach examining individual level data and interactions in the context of community in order to understand the many, the many factors that produce different outcomes in either terms of crime or reactions of the criminal justice system. And, and through all this, he weaves the effects of race which conditions many of these outcomes. Eric, for creating this complex and enlightening tapestry, the American Society of Criminology names you a fellow of the society. So we move on to the Herbert Block Award. Um, this, year it's, this year we have two recipients, I think. Um, the Herbert Block Award, established in 1961, recognizes outstanding service contribution to the American Society of Criminology and to the professional interests of criminology. This year, the committee struggled mightily to make a single award, but in the end, they could not, and they made two. After considerable debate, the executive board could not distinguish two deserving but very different candidates. One whose service to the ASC and the discipline of criminology spans 30 years, and the other whose careful stewardship of an innovative policy initiative has brought dramatic success. I am pleased to award the Herbert Block Award to Robert Crutchfield and Nancy Levin. Over a 25-year period, Bob has held virtually every office and shouldered every responsibility available in criminology and sociology. He has served the ASC Vice President in 1998, repeatedly served on the Sutherland Committee, the Program Committee for several annual meetings, the Nominations Committee, the Grants and Contracts Committee. I'm running out of committees and breath. He chaired the Affirmative Action Committee. Most recently, uh, he chaired the Fellows Committee. Finally, he is currently serving on the Ethics Committee, despite the fact that he is now officially retired. So, Bob's service to the Society in Journals of Criminology and, uh, and uh, Crime and Public Policy. Bob has been on the editorial board of criminology several times during the period uh, uh, 1987 to 2000. He served a more critical role as uh, the journal's deputy editor for 1984 to 1987. Um, I, I've got a bunch, I got another paragraph, so I'll skip it. I, you, get, you get the idea, I think. Uh, um, so um, I should also note that his addiction to serving on committees continues as he just agreed to be chair of the Law and Society uh, Justice Committee of the National Academy of Sciences. So congratulations. <laughs> I think Nancy Levin throughout her career has demonstrated and embodied the importance of translating research evidence to larger audiences, thereby elevating the presence of the field in the policy making process. More specifically, over the last few years, Nancy has served as the chair of the Criminal Justice Research Alliance, a joint venture of ASC and ACJS created in 2013 to be a single voice for the criminology and criminal justice research community and to advocate for the use of research by criminal justice policymakers and practitioners. 
Nancy has shown both dedication and skill in this role that is deserving of the Block Award. Congratulations. Nancy. The next award is the August Vollmer Award. Uh, this year it goes to David Weisberg, George Mason University, and Hebrew University. <laughs> the August Vollmer Award, established in 1959, recognizes an individual whose scholarship or professional activities have made outstanding contributions to justice or to the treatment or prevention of criminal or delinquent behavior. Uh, David, uh, it is with great pleasure that I present to you the American Society of Criminology 2017 Vollmer Award. In selecting you for this honor, the awards committee noted your accomplishments across a broad spectrum of criminal justice and criminological issues, and particularly hot spots, policing, crime, and crime displacement. The, the committee also noted that your contributions to crime prevention theory and practice are both applied and international in scope. If we waited a while, we could have included the National Academy of Science report on proactive policing, which you just presented on this morning, I believe, and so to add to your list of accomplishments. So, um, so uh, uh, for all this work and all the work you're yet to do, we give you this honor. <laughs> The next award is uh, the Thorstein, Celine, and Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck Award. Um, this year, the, uh, the, the, award goes to, uh, the award goes to Herben uh, Brusema from the ne Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement. Uh, the, uh, this award was established in 1974 and is, and is given in order to call attention to criminological scholarship that considers problems of crime and justice as they are manifest outside the United States, internationally, and comparatively. Um, this year's award is given to Herbin Brunsema, not only for a lifetime of exceptional scholarly work, but also for institution building, and especially for building NCSR into a force in criminology that it is today. It was not long ago when there was very little quantitative criminology done in Europe to complement their rich theoretical tradition. There are some scholar, there are some scholars in England, and Jan van Dijk and some colleagues in the Netherlands were doing work uh, with the International Crime Victimization Survey. NCSR has changed all of that. There is a steady stream of innovative quantitative work and well-trained re researchers flowing, flowing from the Netherlands. Much of this is due to Herben. So, Unfortunately, Herbin cannot be with us today. As many of you know, he has been gravely ill for some time. It started with a medical mishap with his heart, but in treating that, they found a serious lung disease. Uh, he is currently waiting for a lung transplant, which I didn't even know they could do. So uh, he's amazing. Uh, he really is a profile in courage. Whenever you talk to him, he's always so upbeat, and he, uh, he guaranteed me he would be able to be here, and I think he firmly believed that but because uh, he's a very, uh, very positive, very upbeat guy who's done a lot uh, to build institutions uh, of criminology in Europe. So um, he has asked his colleague, uh, Katrin Buldeveld, uh, to accept the award for him. So. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, the Edwin H. Sutherland Award and Address. Um, this year, I'm, I'm honored to give this award to, to Richard Rosenfeld, University of Missouri, St. Louis. Uh, uh, the Edward Sutherland Award, uh, established in the 1960s, recognizes outstanding contributions to theory or research in criminology on the etiology of, of criminal and deviant behavior, the criminal justice system, corrections, law, or justice. The distinguished contribution may be based on a single outstanding book or work, or a series of theoretical or research contributions, or on an accumulated contributions by a senior scholar. I'm pleased to say that this year's winner is Rick Rosenfeld from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. In selecting you for this honor, Rick, the awards committee noted that you have conducted influential research in a number of areas, including homicide and crime trends, social trust, 
firearms, drug markets, policing, and incarceration, and are widely recognized as one of the field's premier experts on homicides and crime trend. Your work in the area of policing has incorporated state-of-the-art method methodological and statistical approaches and helped provide solid evidence that translates directly into public policy. For this body of work, which seems to be growing at a rapid rate, even in, quote, retirement, uh, the committee has chosen you for this award. Rick. Well, thank you. Um, to anyone who had anything to do with this, I'm honored and touched. Uh, I do have a prepared speech. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep it, I can't say I'm going to keep it short, but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible so that we all can get on to eating and drinking. Um, so we should... Uh, Get the title slide up. There we go. I'm going to talk about my work studying crime trends, which has occupied most of my research life. Um, it, I don't think I have to uh, argue with anyone in here that uh, crime is an inherently dynamic phenomenon. It moves over time and across space. We can capture crime in a snapshot and carry out cross-sectional studies of crime levels and corresponding explanatory factors, but to what end? There are some problems for which cross-sectional studies are pertinent or enlightening. Crime is not one of them. This is revealed in many cross-sectional studies themselves when the investigator lapses into the language of change and reports that increases in some factor X leads to increases or decreases in crime. Cross-sectional studies, of course, can tell us no such thing. So goes crime, so goes the study of crime rates. It is of some practical interest to know the crime rate of a given place at a given time and in how it compares to the crime rates of other places at the same time. But the practitioner concerned with crime almost always turns to the question of change. What policy, strategy, or procedure can I change to reduce crime? To answer that question, the evidence-based practitioner must look to theory and research on change over time and crime rates. The study of changing crime rates, crime trends, implicitly informs both the practitioner's and the criminologist's interest in crime. What I do here is set forth some uh, general ideas um, and directions for research uh, and theory on crime trends and illustrate them with some examples from my own work. Most research on crime trends consists of normal science studies of relatively slow change in crime over time in relation to comparably gradual and more or less expected changes in criminal opportunities, incentives, and penalties. Some studies, however, address unexpected and abrupt change in crime rates, uh, brought about by equally abrupt and unanticipated exogenous shocks. Rapid changes in crime that seem to come out of nowhere and defy existing explanations from normal science require new ways of thinking about crime, crime trends, sometimes about crime itself. To illustrate the study of crime trends in the normal science tradition, I draw from my research on the relationship between crime rates and changing macroeconomic conditions. To illustrate the study of abrupt and unexpected change in crime rates resulting from exogenous shocks, I discuss the recent homicide rise in U.S. cities. It's important, of course, not to reify the distinction between normal science and exogenous shocks in the study of crime trends. In fact, promising research on exogenous shocks to crime rates should quickly give way to the skepticism of normal science. 
Contemporary research on crime trends follows a common path. Time series and panel studies estimate the change in crime as a function of change in selected explanatory factors, one of which is usually the investigator's favorite. The findings become the basis for subsequent studies, uh, additional findings emerge, and finally accumulate into an even bigger list of findings about crime trends. The study of crime trends has never been accused of being overly theoretical. Research on crime trends in the economy follows this regression-based normal science path. For most of its history, the study of the economic correlates of crime rates focused primarily on unemployment. But that began to change in the late 20th century in response to the decidedly mixed results of longitudinal studies of crime and unemployment. Some researchers revived the study of crime rates and business cycles, building on the pioneering research of Dorothy Swain Thomas conducted in the 1920s. Others stuck with the unemployment rate but devised new ways of modeling its differing effects on crime. My work focused on the relationship between crime trends and subjective in, uh, economic indicators. When researchers posit that crime rates respond to changing economic conditions, they make assumptions, often implicit, about how individuals think about their economic situation. It would be nice, it would be fortunate, if we had a measure that actually um, uh, reflected how people actually feel about their economic situation so we wouldn't have to fill in that black box uh, with our suppositions about uh, frustration, anger, strain, uh, calculation of costs and benefits, and so forth. We do have such a measure. Uh, comes from the University of Michigan, though there are other measures out there as well. This one, I think, is certainly the best. Um, and using the Index of Consumer Sentiment from the U uh, University of Michigan's uh, series, Robert Fernango and I found that consumer sentiment is a robust predictor of crimes committed for economic gain in the U.S. Uh, as consumers grow more confident about their own financial situation and the general state of the economy, acquisitive crime rates decrease. As consumers become more pessimistic, acquisitive crime rates rise. We concluded that consumer sentiment has a sizable effect on the change over time in acquisitive crime that is independent of the effects of economic growth and unemployment. These results, if anything, qualify as only a minor breakthrough in the study of crime trends. They were produced by theories, models, and measures well within the realm of normal science. But they did help to rescue, at least for a time, the idea that crime rates respond to economic conditions from the, quote, consensus of doubt surrounding the research on crime and unemployment. About this time, we began to work, uh, I began to work out the rudiments of a theory of how the dynamics of underground markets, specifically the market for stolen goods, motivate involvement in both property and violent crime. Like all markets, the market for stolen goods is subject to swings in supply and demand. On the demand side are consumers in the market for cheap stolen goods. On the supply side are the robbers, burglars, and thieves who provide the goods. The demand for stolen goods, I reasoned, will increase as the economy turns down and consumers have less money to spend on comparable items from legal sources. Low-income consumers who shop at the big box discount stores and the retail outlets run by Goodwill and the Salvation Army will be especially likely to trade down to underground sources of supply. A stagnating economy and growing demand for cheap stolen goods strengthens the incentives for criminals to acquire the goods and bring them to market. As a result, rates of acquisitive crime should rise. Acquisitive crimes, including receipt of stolen property, tend to occur in out-of-the-way places where violent crimes can be committed, unimpeded by the police and other custodians of social control. Sellers might injure or kill buyers and vice versa. Property offenders are attractive targets for violent criminals seeking cash or stolen goods. Just as disputes between drug sellers over choice business locations and access to supply sources 
sometimes turn violent. The same is true for other actors who ply their trade in illegal underground markets. Acquisitive crime can be risky business. The expansion of the market for stolen goods and the increase in acquisitive crime, I hypothesize, should boost the homicide rate. Furthermore, if the foregoing logic holds, the change in inquisitive crime rates should mediate the relationship between the change over time in homicide rates and the change in macroeconomic conditions, including consumer sentiment. In a paper titled, Crime is the Problem, I found support for these hypotheses. The results were heartening because the hypotheses were derived from a theory that joined ethnographic research in, on underground markets with macro-level crime trends. I thought I might have achieved something of importance in the study of crime trends. In addition, other studies were beginning to return results that also supported a connection between the state of the economy and crime rates. I believed we might have crushed the consensus of doubt once and for all. Then came the Great Recession of 2008, and for a time, everything went to hell. The Great Recession was the single largest downturn in the U.S. economy since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Unemployment rates skyrocketed, economic growth turned negative, and consumer confidence plummeted. Surely crime rates would increase as they had during previous recessions. Uh, but crime rates did not turn up. They went down. How could that be? Why did the world fail to conform to prior research and emerging theory on the effect of the economy on crime? Now, the honest researcher has limited options in the face of such a catastrophe. He or she can abandon the theory. In this case, that meant agreeing with the late James Q. Wilson that crime has little to do with the state of the economy. Or the researcher can return to the theory, take it apart, figure out what went wrong, and try to fix it. I chose the second option. I began to read extensively about the Great Recession and previous economic downturns. I discovered that although most of the major economic indicators portrayed an economy on the verge of collapse, one did not. The year over year, a rise in consumer prices or inflation. In fact, inflation rates were running at historic lows during the Great Recession. I then searched the literature for evidence of inflation effects on crime. It's not a large body of research and inflation is generally included as a control variable without much theoretical development. But in nearly every study I could find, the effect of inflation on the, of inflation on the change in crime rates is positive and significant. Increases in crime coincide with increases in inflation, and decreases in crime are associated with decreases in inflation. Adding inflation to the suite of economic indicators in the study of crime trends also made theoretical sense. It's not a stretch to suppose that low-income consumers respond to price changes. Perhaps low inflation then, I thought, might help to solve the puzzle of falling crime rates during the Great Recession. With Aaron Levin, I carried out a comprehensive assessment of the relationship between acquisitive crime and inflation, consumer sentiment, unemployment, income, and economic growth in the U.S. between 1960 and 2012. The results of a model averaging exercise revealed that inflation outperformed the other economic indicators in its effect on acquisitive crime rates, uh, with consumer sentiment a close second. The study also disclosed that declining inflation rates, in fact, consumer prices actually declined in, nine, in 2009, largely explained the reduction in acquisitive crime rates during the Great Recession. This work on the economy and crime took place within the customary confines of normal science. New empirical indicators were discovered or devised that better fit underlying concepts and propositions. New results complemented or supplanted older ones, all in the service of the ages-old belief that how human beings experience the material conditions of life affects their willingness to follow or break the rules. My thinking about crime was shaped by this hardy, if also quite narrow, 
conception of the more or less predictable movement of crime over time. But crime rates sometimes behave in ways that defy expectations from the normal science of crime trends. On these occasions, simply incorporating new empirical indicators into the same old theoretical models is not sufficient. The models themselves have to be replaced. That's the challenge posed by exogenous shock to theory and research on crime trends, and an example is the recent rise in homicide rates in the United States. Led by the New York Times, the press began to report that many U.S. cities were experiencing homicide increases after years of decline in the year 2015. The director of the FBI at the time, James Comey, soon weighed in, suggesting that the increases may have been caused by the reluctance of the police to engage in vigorous law enforcement activities in the midst of widely publicized and controversial incidents of police use of force. No sooner had media reports of a homicide rise begun to appear, other accounts countered that the increase was overblown. The evidence marshaled by both sides of the debate was either purely impressionistic or based on small samples of cities of uncertain representativeness. In late 2015, in fact at this meeting, Nancy Rodriguez, then the director of the National Institute of Justice, asked me to conduct a study to determine whether a meaningful homicide increase had in fact occurred, and if it had, to provide research guidelines for uncovering its causes. And my report appeared the following June. To establish whether homicides were increasing, I examined data on homicides recorded in 2015 by the police departments of 56 large U.S. cities. I concluded that the homicide rise was not a media creation. It was real, it was comparatively large, and it came on the heels of a long-term decline in homicide rates in most big cities. In a follow-up study released just this morning by NIJ, uh, I conducted with Shaitiera Gaston, Howard Spivak, and Siri Irizola. We documented the homicide rise with data from the 2015 and 2016 Uniform Crime Reports for the nation as a whole and for uh, large U.S. cities. The U.S. homicide rate, the national rate, rose by 11.4 percent between 2014 and 15. That's the largest or was the largest in percentage increase in a single year since 1968. The national rise in homicide was driven by increases in the big cities. Cities are identified here. I don't expect you to, <laughs> to see them. Uh, but what this figure displays is the percentage change in homicides between 2014 and 15 in cities with populations of 250,000 or more. Um, to avoid unreliable percentage change based on low homicide counts, the 46 cities shown in the figure all had 30 or more homicides in 2014. Homicides uh, in this sample rose 17.2 percent overall. In 14 of the cities, homicide increased by over 25 percent. In nine of the cities, the increase exceeded 50 percent. Not all, as you can see, not all of the big cities experienced an increase in homicide between 2014 and 15. But overall increases of this magnitude, which persisted through 2016 at a somewhat diminished rate, certainly do merit attention. Most of the commentary on the recent homicide rise has focused in one way or another on elevated tensions between the police and African American communities. Consistent with this explanation, the African American homicide victimization increased by 15 percent between 2014 and 2015. But the homicide victimization rate among non-Hispanic whites also turned up in 2015. Not as steeply as you can see here as the increase among African Americans, but at a rate greater than in any year since the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack. The white homicide offending rate also registered a notable increase. The homicide increase among whites fits less easily into the narrative of police community tensions associated with police use of deadly force against African Americans and other minorities and prompts the search for other explanations of the recent homicide rise. 
the theories, constructs, and tools of normal science were not prepared for the recent homicide rise. It was too large, abrupt, and unexpected to be explained by changing macroeconomic conditions, which in any event were moving in the wrong direction. The age distribution of the population doesn't change rapidly enough to explain such a precipitous increase in crime. In recent years, neither has the prison population, although it's been gradually declining since 2009. Whatever events or conditions had caused the homicide rise had to themselves have changed very rapidly. They had to be exogenous shocks to the long-run change in homicide rates associated with changing demographic and economic and certain policy conditions, although they may have interacted with those conditions and their effects. Two likely candidates for the exogenous shocks are an increase in police community tensions in the aftermath of widely publicized and controversial incidents of police use of force, and secondly, the expansion of illicit drug markets resulting from the heroin and synthetic opioid epidemic. The case for attributing the recent homicide rise to, to policing has two variants. The first and most popular account holds that the police greatly reduced their proactive enforcement efforts because they risk heightened legal liability or social media exposure in the wake of widespread hostility and unrest surrounding incidents of the use of deadly force against minority and in particular African American suspects. This is the version of, the, of events that inspired the catchphrase, the Ferguson effect. The second argument linking the homicide rise to policing essentially turns the first one on its head. And instead of the police withdrawing from the community, in this scenario, the community or certain communities withdraw from the police. This explanation points to compromised police legitimacy as the culprit in the homicide rise. When citizens don't view the police or other legal authorities as worthy of respect, they're less likely to report crimes, cooperate in investigations, act as witnesses, and obey the law. The two versions of the policing narrative then stipulate that homicide will increase as the police, community members, or both disengage from the civic pact between citizens and the state necessary to keep the peace. In our follow-up study of the homicide rise, we looked at recent arrest and homicide trends in cities with 250,000 or more residents. The results of this admittedly cursory exercise provide ambiguous support at best for the Ferguson effect. The arrest offense ratio for violent crimes in the big cities did decrease slightly between 2014 and 15 when homicide began to increase. But it had been flat or falling for several years before that when homicide was on the decline in the big cities. If the reduction in proactive policing, at least as measured by arrests, caused the homicide spike, why did it take so long to take effect? For that matter, why were the police making fewer arrests per violent crime several years before the events in Ferguson, Baltimore, and Chicago, and other cities that presumably caused the police to draw back? We also looked at arrest rates for less serious crimes, such as simple assault, disorderly conduct, and weapons offenses, and they tell the same story. Declining arrest rates after Ferguson and declining arrest rates before Ferguson. Arrests, of course, are not the only and arguably not the best measure of vigorous policing. Uh, in addition, it's possible that reductions, reductions in arrests were aligned more closely in time with the homicide rise in the cities that experienced the greatest homicide increases. City-level, multivariate studies are needed to draw convincing conclusions about the relationship between the homicide rise and changes in proactive policing. For now, though, the case for the Ferguson effect remains wide open. The other version of the policing explanation for the homicide rise switches the focus from police behavior to community attitudes and beliefs. This explanation directs attention to the long history of fraught relationships between the police and communities of color in the United States. People who trust the police endow their legal authority with legitimacy. When the police lack legitimacy, people tend to avoid them, are less likely to contact them to settle interpersonal disputes, and are more likely to seek private vengeance. 
Alienation from the means of formal social control gives rise to per pervasive legal cynicism, the emergence of honor cultures, and peremptory and retaliatory violence, especially in economically disadvantaged communities lacking access to alternative forms of protection and conflict resolution. The reservoir of discontent with the police stretches back to the slave patrols and police enforcement of Jim Crow segregation laws and helps to explain the enduring racial gap in violent crime in American cities. But how then can it explain the sudden rise in homicide in 2015? The spark that set the reservoir aflame in this rendering of the policing narrative was the upsurge in controversial incidents of police brutality and accompanying social unrest across US cities. As is the case for the de-policing explanation, extensive research is needed to confirm the hypothesis that compromised police legitimacy um, sparked the recent homicide rise. Until then, the connection between police legitimacy and the recent homicide rise, like the connection with de-policing, will remain an open empirical question. Has the opioid epidemic contributed to the homicide rise? Relatively little attention has been devoted to this possibility either in either the commentary on the homicide rise or the opioid epidemic. Unlike the crack epidemic of the late 1980s, the opioid epidemic has been viewed mainly as a public health crisis rather than a criminal justice problem. That may be because the opioid epidemic is concentrated in the white population or as a consequence of evolving views on how public policy should respond to drug abuse. There are suggestive indications, however, that drug-related violence began to rise at about the same time as homicide rates overall were increasing in the United States. The FBI supplementary homicide reports code homicides by circumstance, one of which is a homicide associated with the felony violation of narcotic drug laws. The year-over-year -year percentage change between 2011 and 2015 in drug homicides, other felony homicides, and non-felony homicides um, are shown in, in the figure that's up there now. Homicides associated with other felonies and non-felony homicides exhibit relatively small fluctuations over the five-year period. By contrast, drug homicides fell at a diminishing rate between 2011 and 14, and then rose by about 21% between 14 and 15. The rise in drug-related homicides accounted for approximately 22% of the total increase in homicides with known circumstances in 2015. Because the police are less likely to know the circumstances of drug-related homicides than those of other homicides, this back-of-the-envelope result is probably a conservative estimate of the contribution of drug-related killings to the total homicide rise in 2015. There's a credible circumstantial case for assuming that expanding drug markets and mounting drug violence contributed to the recent homicide rise. A final piece of, the ev of evidence alluded to earlier also bolsters the case, the rise in homicide among whites. As I mentioned, the opioid epidemic is disproportionately concentrated in the white population. As whites enter illicit drug markets in greater numbers, they, they become subject to the systemic violence that can characterize such stateless social locations. Detailed city and neighborhood level studies will be needed to determine whether the rise in white homicide rates resulted from their greater involvement as buyers and sellers in illicit drug markets. At present, however, that appears to be a more likely cause of the increase in white homicide than the de-policing of white communities or white discontent with the police. I am finishing. <laughs> I, can, I can hear you, even though I can sense you want me to finish, and I do as well. So exogenous shocks to crime trends are not new. Recent examples include the abrupt rise in crime during the 1960s, the sharp rise in youth violence during the late 1980s, and the crime drop beginning in the early 90s. Each of these shocks reversed the previous trajectory of crime rates and initially bewildered criminologists. Eventually, though, each succumbed to the constraints of normal science. 
That didn't necessarily end debates about their causes, but the, the debates were fought on firmer scientific ground. Depending on how long it lasts, the same should occur in the case of the recent homicide rise. I've drawn from my own work to illustrate both the normal science of crime trends and the periodic disruptions to normal science produced by exogenous shocks. My studies of crime trends and changing macroeconomic conditions exemplify the fits and starts, the accomplishments and the disappointments of normal science. My efforts to comprehend the recent homicide rise reveal the uncertainty, the guesswork, and germinal attempts to make sense of disruptions to accustomed ways of thinking about changing crime rates. I also hope to have conveyed some of the intellectual excitement derived from the study of crime trends. The excitement, the excitement comes from both the conventional conduct of normal science and the unexpected encounters with exogenous shocks. Normal science takes place within the context of scientific verification, whereas exogenous shocks must be confronted in the context of scientific discovery. Recall my dismay with the failure of crime rates during the Great Recession to conform to my models of crime and consumer sentiment. But disappointment turned to excitement when I found another economic indicator, inflation, that behaved as expected. Now, whether I was right about any of this is for others to determine. But right or wrong, the point is that this pursuit was wholly in keeping with the norms and practices of normal scientific verification. If one indicator does not produce the expected result, try another. And continue trying until theoretical expectations are met or the theory must be abandoned. It would have been a mistake, at least in my view, to ditch the theory of underground markets without fully exhausting its empirical implications a case of what we might call premature falsification. The rigorous rules of normal science require the researcher to methodically investigate every conceivable inference from existing theory before calling it quits. The rules of normal science are relaxed in the context of discovery. They're relaxed, they're not discarded. New or different theories are entertained, but initially at least they should bear some resemblance to existing knowledge. Although the discovery process is not aimless, it often steers the investigator in unforeseen directions. For example, I was surprised to discover a significant upturn in homicide among whites. I did not think the increase in white homicide could be easily attributed to heightened hostilities between whites and the police, um, although that remains an open empirical question. I had to consider other recent changes affecting whites that could have elevated their homicide risks. That led me to the opioid epidemic that sent growing numbers of whites into illicit drug markets. I could think of few reasons why white buyers and sellers would be immune to the violence of these anomic social spaces. That conjecture in turn implied that drug-related homicides should have increased, which they did, pushing up overall homicide rates in 2015. As I mentioned, there's considerable intellectual pleasure to be gained from discovering hypotheses to explain exogenous shocks and from the normal scientific processes of verification. Nowhere in criminology, in my view, is the excitement of discovery and verification greater than in, than in the investigation of crime trends. That's because change, both expected and unexpected, is the very nature of crime. My hope is that the coming generation of criminologists will find the study of changing crime rates as worthwhile as I have. N now let's eat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can't eat. Uh, before you eat, I have to correct a mistake. Um, uh, when we awarded the uh, Ruth Peterson Fellowship was awarded, I was led to believe there were only two of the recipients in the room, but there, there is the third recipient, and I'd like to have him come up and be acknowledged. And the, uh, Charles Bell from Wayne State University. <laughs> Charles Bell is a PhD candidate in the sociology department at Wayne State University. His research focuses on race, gender, school discipline, mass incarceration, and mental health. 
His dissertation employs a critical qualitative methodology using semi-structured interviews to assess African-American students and parents' perception of school discipline. As, as studies substantiate school removal via suspension or expulsion as a predictor of future incarceration, Charles' study seeks to explore how African-American students and parents perceive school discipline and its impact on achievement, relationships with teachers and peers, social status, parental employment, masculinity and femininity, and the per perception of law enforcement officers. Charles, we hope that this fellowship gives you the time to finish your dissertation uh, and get this important information into the school prison pipeline debate. So, and again, apologies to Charles. I think, uh, let me say two things. Uh, one is all you recipients, especially David Weisberg, who's been trying to get out of here for the last five minutes, I think that, that uh, we have to stay because we, we, we need a photo of you. The rest of you are free to go to Salon F, which is right around the corner, and begin celebrations. So thank you very much.